My name is Eric Smith, and um, I'm the president of Redwood Media Group. This is Rick Barnett, our business development director. Most of you know Rick. Linda Mariano, director of marketing. Mark Shapiro, our East Coast rep. And we'll have a few more floating in in a little bit. So the purpose of us doing this talk every year at um, Art Expo, at the beginning of Art Expo, is to really give you guys a real quick education on what you're going to experience today, especially today, trade day. We open at 12 o'clock today, and from 12 to 4, it's, uh, it's open to the trade. And, you know, just to explain what the trade is, and let's just kind of pretend that background noise isn't here, and you guys just take a deep breath and concentrate on what we're saying and it won't be a big deal. So we're going to have designers, architects, gallery owners, frame shop owners, um, etc., trade buyers. And that's how Art Expo started. It really started as a trade show 39 years ago. Uh, and all the galleries from around the world would shop here. This was mainly the only show in New York. Um, and so they would fly in and for the first two days it was trade only. That's changed a bit over the years because we don't have serography anymore. Not a lot of people are doing lithography. Limited editions aren't as big a thing as they were, you know, 30, even 20, even 15 years ago. I worked for a company called Martin Lawrence Galleries for 10 years and we published Andy Warhol, Keith Haring, and many, many artists. And, you know, we would come out with editions and bring them to Art Expo and that's where people would buy them. It's a little different today, but there's still a really good wholesale market. And you should be aware of that. So very quickly, you know, uh, the lingo in the art business is when you're discounting work is 50-10, 50-20, 50-50. And what that means is just so you know and you don't get shocked by a designer saying I need less 30 or a gallery says, you know, I buy at 50-10. What that means is if you're retailing a piece of art for 5,000, 50 off would be 2,500 and 10 off that would be 5,250. So it would be 50-10, that's 50-10. 50-50 would be the way publishers buy. Publishers are big, there's a lot of big publishers on the main floor out there and they buy usually at 50-50. That's 50 off your price and another 50% off. So a $10,000 piece, they'd be buying at 2,500. You gotta say to yourself, why is Eric telling me this? Because there's no way I'm gonna sell my piece, the $10,000 piece at 2,500. But you might. And you might make a lot of money doing it if you're a fast painter. So first question today is, how many of you can paint more than 100 paintings a year? I know you can, Tanner. <laughs> that's a good job and that's what galleries and designers and people are looking for somebody that's prolific that can pump out the work you got to you know kind of think about it if, if somebody approaches you and it happens every year to some of the artists here in solo you might get approached by somebody who's already in the industry and is a, a publisher or a gallery owner and they'll say I want to represent you I bought a piece of work yesterday before we even opened from a guy I've known for 20 years who found a new artist and he said, you got to see this. And I went over and uh, showed Kelly, my wife, and then my daughters and they were like, we got to have that. We got to have that, you know? And I said to him, when did you find this guy? He said, about a month ago, I signed him to a contract immediately. And I don't think he'll mind you saying he's paying the artist quite a bit of money every month, more money than I make. <laughs> and, and the guy's supplying the work, and that's how this business works sometimes. So, you know, again, don't be shocked and don't be taken aback if people start talking about, you know, the, the art pricing and, and things in the industry. You should, you know, grab that and talk to the person and, you know, make them your partner if you can. Now, if you're somebody that can only paint 15 paintings a year, how many of those are out there? Come on, I know there's some of you can only do, okay, 50, 200? 
There you go. So if you can only do like 15 or 20 paintings a year, you know, and you think about if you wanted to have an art dealer, how many galleries, or gallery, how many galleries could you supply? Probably one, right? So, you know, if you live in Kansas City and you got a gallery in Kansas City, and that's going to be your universe. You're never going to be national or international because you're going to be in Kansas City. So you've got to think about other ways to, you know, broaden your distribution, and that could be through licensing, it could be through um, prints, doing multiples, digital printing, that type of thing. Um, this is Mark Shapiro. Mark's been in the industry for quite a few years. Yeah, move up to the mic. And uh, uh, his family had a, a chain of galleries for many years and published many artists. And he worked for Martin Lawrence also, and they published Erte and many good programs in the industry. And um, do you have anything to add, Mark? I think you're covering everything. Uh, distributors, distribution channels are important these days. You need to be able to uh, pick out a few markets you really want to be in, the Los Angeles market, San Francisco, wherever you want to be, and, and really find distributions in those areas where they're going to be catering to the masses when you're publishing limited editions, it's important. If you're selling originals, it's important as well. But there's other ways you can like move artwork. Um, at shows like this one, this is a great opportunity. It shows that we have on the West Coast another great opportunity. But think to yourself in terms of selling collectively to the large group, not just to individual consumers. That's important. So this is an open forum, um, and you guys are allowed to ask questions anytime, because many of you haven't exhibited with Art Expo before or any of our shows, and so if you have any questions, just raise your hand, because it's probably the same question somebody else has. Yeah, I have a question about the Monday. Hi. Hi. Um, Monday, I saw free packaging, and I didn't know anything about that until I saw it. I don't even remember where I saw it, online probably. Could you tell us about that, what the deal we'll, is? We'll have a wrapping station, so as people come in, you know, we want to create some commotion, and you want people to be wrapping up art and leaving with it. So let's say that you sell some pieces over the weekend, but you don't want to take them off your wall. Quite often you can say to the buyer, why don't you leave them with me? We'll put a red dot on there, right? And then come back Monday, we'll wrap it up for you and you can take it away or I'll deliver it. Yeah, we could store it too. We could store it. Yeah, we have a storage area right here. Yeah. I'm probably belaboring this point, but can you kind of walk me through the potential conversation that would happen if you're sitting there as an artist, someone comes up, they say they're a gallery, like do they kind of say, hey, I want 50% off? It's like, do they talk about conversation of the... Well, the first, thing you, the first thing you want to do is talk about your work, right? And you should, yeah, you should always talk about your work first. And every one of you should have a story about every piece. You're the artist. I don't paint. I can draw a really crappy dog. My mom taught me to do it years ago. But I don't paint. I'm kind of the business side of art, and that's where I've made my living. But you know what I do know is I like to collect, and I love to hear the stories of artists. I like to travel with artists. I traveled with many of them, and you know they're interesting. They have a whole other side of the brain that's working that mine isn't, and people want to know that. So know, engage them in conversation. A lot of the people will ask you, you know, how is this made or, you know, is this a digital print or is this an original? And they don't know. And explain, you know, when you started painting, why you paint, you know, and then listen because they will ask a question. And good, you know, as an artist, it's hard to also be a good salesperson, but a good salesperson is the best listener. So. Yep, same thing. Same thing with the trade. I mean, gallery owners want to know. They need to have a story to tell the consumers. So it's exactly the same thing. If you, I'll give you a real quick example. We hired an artist years ago. I won't tell you her name, but she was like a, she was a good painter. We decided to put her in and do a couple shows with her in some of our galleries in Northridge, California and Newport Beach. So the first time I took her to a show, people came up and started asking her questions and she was like blank faced and really didn't have any story, but she was a really good painter. And the next day I 
grabbed her. I said, we got to have coffee. I went over to our headquarters, walked her into Barry Levine, who was the president of Martin Lawrence, and I said, you got to give her a personality because we're not going to sell any art without her opening her mouth and talking, you know. I mean, she, you really got to be personable and, and, and engage people. It's important. And the same with the galleries. And then when you get into the numbers, that's what you're talking about. You know, be honest with them and let them know. If you can paint, I don't know how much your pieces are. Let's just say, for, for example, they're $5,000. You got to think about a gallery owner. They have to pay rent people. They got to buy wine for parties. They got to hang the work. You know, they've got to pay the electricity. They got to open the doors every day. They got to vacuum every morning. And they got a lot of work to do. And, you know, you, you can't be the, the greedy artist. You've got to think about making them your partner. So, you know, work a deal with them. Say, here's how much I can paint. Here's how much money I'd like to make. You know, hopefully you can sell this many pieces. And if you do, you know, I'm willing to take $2,000 for a $5,000 piece. And maybe he's going to ask for consignment because a lot of people do now. You know, in the old days, people would buy everything. And today, most, most everything is on consignment. So, you know, you gotta, you got to remember that. Eric, can I say something real quick? Yeah. So, uh, first of all, we're glad that you're here. You know, it's <clears throat> it's disruptive right now, uh, obviously. Oh, Rosanna, would you come up as well? Have a seat. So this is Rosanna Rader. Rosanna handles uh, part of our market as well. And Steve Churning, who handles Asia, uh, is probably handling Asia right now. Uh, but he handles our Asian market. So we've got... Uh, salespeople that handle each portion of the market throughout the United States. Currently, our five cities, uh, including our new Las Vegas show, uh, are all in the United States. So when you are interested in leaving New York and moving on to Santa Fe, uh, we will, any unsold work, we will uh, ship and store for free and deliver to your Santa Fe uh, uh, exhibition site at no charge. We'll ship it from here, we'll store it from here, we'll ship it and deliver it to your Santa Fe location at no charge, and from Santa Fe we'll move it to San Diego, and from San Diego we'll move it to Miami, and from Miami we'll move it to Las Vegas, and then back to New York, and all of it, that entire cycle is no charge. It's free, especially important for European or overseas exhibitors, right? But a couple of quick things that I want to give you that I think are important. First of all, Eric and I will walk the show uh, tonight, and tomorrow morning we'll walk the show again. And let me tell you what we will see. We will see certain exhibitors that are readjusting their paintings, they're making sure that their collateral material is all correct, they're dressed sharp, they look alert, they've gotten plenty of sleep, they've drank lots of water, they are smiling, they are engaging with their clients, and as the show progresses, we will be able to tell who's gonna do well at this show and who isn't. Now, the ones that aren't gonna do well, let me tell you what they look like. They are the ones that are on their iPads or on their cell phones looking at them all during the show and waiting for somebody to walk down the aisle and beat them over the head to buy the artwork from them. They are eating in their booth, which is the absolute worst thing that you can do. And yet I can guarantee you in this crowd, let alone the people that didn't make this meeting, in this crowd there are going to be a few of you that are going to be guilty for eating in your booth. It is an absolute positive no-no. First of all, it looks horrible. Secondly, it smells. Okay, easy, Rick. Yeah. <laughs> Every year we go through this and it is so frustrating because you guys have spent so much money to get here. You've worked so hard to create your artwork and yet you will do the most obvious things wrong. You Just think of it this way. This is a marathon, this is not a sprint. You are on stage for the next four days. When people walk by your booth, they expect you to be happy, alert. Doesn't matter if you didn't sell anything on Friday, you didn't sell anything on Saturday, and now it's Sunday. 
Some of you are going to be weak, and you're going to let that emotion present itself to the clients on Sunday, and they're going to see it. They are going to look at you and say, not verbally, but they're going to think subconsciously, loser's limp. That person has loser's limp. And they're not going to want to do business with loser's limp. They are not. They are going to go over to Renson, where the girls are happy and bubbly and whatever, and they've got a story to tell. And they're going to go buy the artwork from Renson and from Samir because they are always on stage. And they are going to walk by you because you have got loser's limp, you're looking at your cell phone or you're eating in your booth, and they are going to say, I'm not going to do business with that person. Plain and simple. And then, here's the worst thing that's going to happen. On Monday, I'm going to be talking to some people who are going to say, it wasn't really a good show. And I think, really? We just got done talking to this person over here who sold 17 pieces. We got one, 30 pieces over here. But this one's telling me it's not a good show. And I'll play back the tapes of when I walked by their booth and they were working on their cell phone or playing with their iPad or eating or having a frumpy face. And I'll think, no, it wasn't a good show. Not for them. And it won't be. You have got to understand that you are on stage. This is a theater performance for the next four days. When you spend money to go to Disneyland, and I'm just like getting ready to take my family down to Disneyland, right? I've got three kids and their children, and I'm gonna take my wife, and we're gonna spend three nights, four, two, two park days in Disneyland. Do you know how much it costs to do that and stay at the Hotel California? $21,000. That's what it's gonna cost me, $21,000 for three days and two nights, $21,000. But the thing that I know is when I walk into Disneyland, from the moment I get in, because I'll get the early passes that'll get me in there at 8 o'clock, from the moment I walk in, everybody is going to be in character. They're all going to be smiling. They're all going to be helpful. And when I get there at 8 and when I leave there at midnight after the fireworks, everybody is going to be helpful, upbeat, positive, and so forth. That's the Disneyland experience. I expect it when I spend $20,000 for three days. Well. You think, as an artist, you're entitled to let your emotions take hold because you've made the work, you've spent the money, you're going to be at the show. It's really up to the customer to make, customer to make you happy. It doesn't work that way. You are on stage. You must perform. If you do not, you will not sell. Plain and simple. So understand that. That's what goes on at these shows, and especially New York. Because here's what happens in New York. You see how many exhibitors we have? Hundreds. And when you're not on stage, they're going to go to the next booth that is, and the next one that is. And then they will skip over you until they finally find somebody that's interesting. And Eric said earlier, you've got to have a story to tell. Absolutely. You've got to have a story to tell. They don't care if you're an expert at cobalt blue or titanium white. They don't care. What they want to know is what inspired you to paint the painting that you painted. Why do you do the work that you do? They want to understand that. I mean, I know I bought a painting from Kevin in Miami this last year, paid a lot of money. More money than I have paid for any piece of artwork that I can remember in a long time. And it's going to be hanging in my new office. But when I asked, when I asked Kevin about it, he had a whole story to tell me about it. And when I go home and hang that painting and somebody looks at it and tells me about the painting, guess what I'm going to tell them? I'm not going to tell them, oh, Kevin Grass is the artist. He uses titanium white and cobalt blue. Isn't it wonderful? I'm going to tell them all about the story of the painting and how I got it. You have got to create an interesting story that's engaging and worth repeating to your clients. Remember, please remember this. And if Linda were here, she'd be telling you this. The people are going to buy the experience that you provide, not the painting. They're going to provide the experience. And the painting will go home, or the sculpture will go home as the souvenir of that experience. That's what's going to happen. When people come walking into their home, they're not going to say, oh, yeah, I was at Art Expo. I bought it. They're going to tell them all about you. And guess what? If you're boring, they're not going to buy it. And if they do buy it, they're not going to tell, say anything about you. You have got to be excited and, and motivated when the people come walking by. I'm not talking about a car salesman with their hand out going, hey. I'm not talking about that. 
I'm saying you've got to be available and engaging, friendly, and always on stage, always on stage, not with your iPad or your cell phone, not eating. You've got to have a smile on your face and be engaging. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, thanks. I have a question. Um, so to that point about not eating or, yeah. or um, like, I can't go eight hours without going to the bathroom. I'll right. just say that publicly here. So I'm here by myself, right. and I think there are other artists here by themselves. Yeah. So how do we handle that when you know we need what? to take your a break? Neighbor, your neighbor has the same yeah. problem you have. So, and then and they'd so say, they'll take be a right break, back. Ask your thing. neighbor who you've made friends with. Yeah. You know, while I'm gone, if somebody is interested, here's my cards, would you give it to them and let them know I'm going to be back in 15 minutes. And that's the way you handle it. Yeah. Thanks. Also, could, could one of you speak to photography? You guys have been talking about painters. I'd, l I'd like to hear some things about um, photography sales and at this type of show. Okay. So, uh, Photo Solo happened last year for the first time. Right, Eric? Right. And we're very excited. It grew again this year. We have some uh, master photographers with us at this show. I would encourage everybody to go look at Michael Ezra's work. Absolutely amazing. But we have, we have master photographers that are at this show. And we have some new emerging photographers that we have discovered that we're very excited about. We think we are bringing to New York a very eclectic, group of photography and photographers and we're very excited about it our photo solo shows are growing not only here in new york but in all of our locations and we encourage all of our photographers that were vetted into this show to reapply to get into our other shows as well photography is becoming a very exciting part of art expo new york and it's growing in our other shows yeah it is uh, there's a guy here named jordan matter who does the dancers you might have walked by his booth. And uh, he's been with us for four years now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I discovered him through my daughter, who was a dancer, and she graduated from the Scripps College of Photography. And uh, she wanted to intern for him and called him. And he called me. He says, I know who your dad is, and I really would like to do one of his shows. So we formed a relationship, and he's been coming for you know, four years now and selling regularly. Photography is, I would liken it to uh, the, the, the limited edition business years ago with serography and lithography and, you know, Yamagata, Salvador Dali, Chagall. People were buying these pieces, you know, for $1,200, $800, you know, <laughs> and they were. Yeah. And, uh, and today, photography is a very easy, you know, beginning collector piece to buy because it speaks for itself. And usually the price points are, you know, lower. And so people start buying art, they usually spend 500 to 800 to $1,200 on their first piece. And then they start growing in their collection and becoming, you know, a bigger and better collector. And we have people that have sold pieces here for $250,000, and we've had other people that sell pieces for $350. So there's all kinds of price ranges here. But photography is that. And um, it, it's, it's happening all around the world. It's, it, we, we think it's going to be a trend for the next 10 years or so. Uh, Rick, uh, when you first started talking about uh, discounting at the show and negotiating with the gallery, that's a gallery. What happens on Saturday and Sunday when we have the general public? How much do they expect to be able to negotiate a price? Well, the, the galleries will pop in all weekend. So okay. today's like four hours of strictly trade. So right. it's not going to be as crowded as it is on Saturday and Sunday, obviously, when the public comes in. But, um, you know, the trade people will come in. There'll be a lot of designers. Designers usually want 20 to 30 percent off a piece. They do the work, take it to their client. They come back. Um, I'm sorry, what was your question? Again? So just the general public when they oh. are coming in. Well, I mean, you know, I'm a firm believer that if you're going to give somebody a discount, right? Like, you know, if your pieces are $2,000 and somebody falls in love with one and they want a discount, you know, the best thing to say to them is, why don't you buy two and I'll give you a discount? <laughs> you know, get something back, right? It's the same thing with galleries. If they want to and buy it 50-20, that's, that's fine. Why don't you buy two and I'll consign five? 
Uh -huh. Okay. You know, get them in the game. Get some skin in the game with right. them. You know, right. that's kind of a business 101 okay. type thing. You know. But they do expect to be able. The general public does expect to be able to negotiate. Your job is to create value in the piece. If your piece is two thousand dollars, you want to create two thousand dollars worth of value in talking to them. Okay. The frame itself was three hundred dollars or four hundred dollars. Right. I spent twenty-five hours painting this piece. Right. All right, I'm already done. You know, you sold me. That's a long time, <laughs> <laughs> right? You deserve. Right. What would it be? Ten bucks an hour, easy. You know. Right. I mean, you know, think about it. You know. I mean, you got to build value in the piece. And then obviously with the story and everything, but on the business side of it, that's how some artists paint. They paint per square inch, you know, and they charge per square inch, or they paint and they think about if they want to make 30 or 40, 50 bucks an hour and how long it takes them to do it. And that's fair. I mean, that's totally fair. If they had a plumber come into their house, they're going to pay him 80 bucks an hour anyway, right? So nothing wrong with that. Let, let, let me just say something. Eric just brought up something that's very interesting, and I want to encourage all of you to think this through. There are some of you out here, in fact, I'd say probably a large portion of you that do exactly what Eric said, which is they, they price their work at so many dollars per square inch. But let's think about it. Let's say you paint 100 paintings a year. All right, Tanner, you, you are very prolific, right? You can crank them out. But you know, as well as I do, that every once in a while something comes off that easel that's better than others that you've painted, right? Listen, if we, if Michelangelo uh, priced his Mona Lisa at dollars per square inch, uh, right, it's a pretty small painting, right? My point is, my point is, is that there are going to be certain pieces that you guys paint or certain pictures that you take or certain sculptures that you create that are going to be better than others, plain and simple. And those pieces, those Mona Lisas that come off your easel should be priced differently than the regular rank and file. Don't think that because you're painting six 20 by 30s that they should all be priced at the same price point. Because Kevin is going to create some that are going to be out of the park and some that are going to be good, but not great. Now, he's a great painter, amazing, modern-day Norman Rockwell, artist of the year for this year's Platform Award. I mean, we're looking at an incredible artist, and yet, as good as he is, I'm telling you, there are certain pieces that he paints that are better than others, right? It's just the way it is. So price them accordingly. Don't be afraid to do that. I, I, I would encourage you to do that, really. Another little secret. Don't tell anybody outside of this convention center. <laughs> is, uh, I mean, I ran, you know, uh, 20 galleries. I had 105 people working for me, and we did shows all the time. And, you know, people like permission to buy. What does that mean? They want to know that somebody else has already purchased your work. They want to know how many pieces you paint and you sell per year. They want to know that your prices might have gone up a little bit, right? So there's nothing wrong with putting a red dot up in your booth and put hold on it. Or a couple. We would do shows in our galleries, and what I would usually do is invite uh, really good clients in before the show even opened, and they would buy one or two or three pieces. So we'd have some red dots up. So when the show opened, we already had some sold pieces. And when other people are walking in, and maybe they haven't discovered that artist or bought a piece of art, they'll walk in and say, oh, these are already gone. I better get one for me if I like it, right? So, you know, and then you're asking me, well, what if somebody wants the piece that's on hold? Say, well, then you get it, because this guy didn't pay for it. He just put it on hold. But there's nothing wrong with that at all. You know, I had every one of my directors in the galleries had two or three great pieces in their office. And when we would have collectors come in, we would leave the sliding door open about this far, and they'd walk by and, oh, I got a new piece in my office, and they'd peek in, and they'd say, I'd want to see it. You're not ready for it. <laughs> oh, I really want to see it. You're not ready for it. It's pretty expensive. I want to see it. You slide, you know, they'd buy it, right? But. I mean, those are little tricks in the art world, and they're not really tricks, they're just, it was a great piece of art. I'd usually put a couple Warhols or a good Keith Haring in my office and stuff. And you know, as people progressed, and they were thrilled that they bought them today. I mean, 
you know, Andy Warhol's work that I was selling at 18,000 is now $250,000, Mark and I, so, yeah. you know. Um, what else? A couple of quick things that I'd like to just uh, talk about. Uh, Eric was bring, talking about pricing and there was a question about discounts. So I'm gonna tell you about, just real quick, about my wife and I. I've been in the art business now for three decades, right? I've been in publishing, I've owned galleries, I've opened lots of galleries all around the world, uh, and I've worked with a lot of artists. If anybody should be able to get a discount on a painting, it's going to be guys like me or Eric or people that are up here on this stage. However, I'm just going to tell you the way it is in my family. My wife told me about 10 years ago when we started buying some additional artwork, for, and it happened in Hawaii, and we saw this little painting by Cost in a gallery in, in up, up country Maui. We walked in, and Lori grabs my hand tenderly and looks at me, and she says, you know I'm interested in this artist. And I said, no, I I'm looking forward to it. She says, when we go in there, if I see a painting that I like, and you and I both agree on it, just pay retail. And it was like fingernails on a chalkboard. <laughs> I couldn't believe, I, I thought to my, I can't believe what I'm hearing. Is, is really, is, what, is that what she's telling me? And it goes back to the experience thing. She says, I want to buy a piece of artwork like a regular person. I don't want you hammering this guy and making some backroom deal. I want to be able to buy the artwork, enjoy it, have it on my wall. I don't want to have to go through the rigmarole that you bring these poor people through. She said, I just want to buy it. If we like it and you agree and I agree, just, we can afford it. Just write the check. So we walked in and she saw a piece that we liked. It's in our home in Catalina Island. And she said, oh, I really like it. And I said, well, I like it too. You know, I should have said I hated it. But <laughs> I said, I like it too. And she said, okay, let's get it. So I went over and it was like, I don't know, $8,000. <laughs> it was like, oh my God. I couldn't believe it. It was just so horrible. And I said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. You know? I mean, it was like, it was horrible. But, you know, we we bought like four or five pieces like that. Because when it's for our home and Lori's involved in the decision, I made a de decision that I'm going to honor my wife to make it an exciting art buying experience. It really does go back to the experience thing. So keep that in mind. The other thing, real quick. You got to ask for the sale, though. Well, yes, you do. Yeah. You should always yeah. be. That's right. That's asking right. for That's the right. sale. Yeah, like, you got to ask for the. You business. know, I mean, I've seen Tanner take pieces off the wall and hand them to the person, let them hold it. You know, becomes a piece of them then, and you know, take it off the wall and put it in a little better light. Or, That's it. That's yeah. exactly you right. Know, what Eric uh, just said. And just say, you know. When they say, say, tell me something else about it, tell them something about it, and then just say to them, why don't you buy it? Yeah. And then shake your head up and down. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and either or choice clothes. So Eric said something real important. He said, take it in a better light. We had, we had a, uh, an adage in the gallery, which was, if you don't move it, you don't sell it. In other words, they zero in on a piece, and once they, you can see that they like that piece, you pick it up and you move it. And you put it to a different wall and it now becomes their experience, their personal experience. And then going back to Eric's question about you know, nodding your head and whatever, these, the, a very simple, because a lot of times artists or you might not be well versed at selling or closing, which is fine. So just do this, say, well, you like it. I can see you really like it. Did you want us to ship it, or do you want to take it with you? Yeah. So it, it can be an either-or choice clothes. It doesn't have to be a, a anything other than that simple. Do, do, do you want to take it with you, or do, would you like us to ship it? I don't know what it looked like in my home. Yeah. No, I'm role-playing so, with you. Yeah. I don't know what it looked like in my home. Okay, well, let me bring it over to your house. If it's local, you can do that. No, I didn't say that. I said I'll bring it over to your house. Yeah, well, I live in Canada. But <laughs> you can do that. There'll be a lot of people from Manhattan. There are. Yep. And, you know, if you have transportation or you fit in a taxi or whatever you can do, let me tell you something. You take it to their house? Don't take just one. No, no. no. 
Uh, there was, you know, when I ran these galleries, we had a, I made each of my consultants do three home shows a week. And sure enough, they'd find somebody and let me bring it over to your house. And they'd go in the back and put the corners on and wrap it up. And they were so proud that they had a home show. And they'd be walking out with one piece. And the last thing I would say to them is, what if they don't like it? And they would sit there with this deer in the headlights look on their face. And I'd say, why don't you take four or five pieces with you? Find something they do like, from the same artist, obviously. So if you're going to go over to somebody's house, and it happens every year, people do. And then they come back to me and they say, oh my god, they bought three pieces. Take four or five pieces. And you know, ask me or Jeff if you, you know, if you need to get in early or we can break the laws a little bit, but not too much. Um, but uh, you know, you can rent a van, you can do, if you get to somebody's house, you're gonna make sales. We had a, we had a gallery in Blue Water, which is outside of London. Now listen to this, we had a gallery in Blue Water outside of London and the gallery owner Every single sale that was made within about a two to three hundred mile radius, every single sale that was made, the owner would tell the salesperson, okay, you can, it, it was 100% delivery. I mean, nobody took their artwork with them. If you were within two to three hundred miles, it was 100% delivery. We deliver and hang no charge. So 100%, I mean, nobody took their paintings. And so Felix would tell the salespeople, you have a choice. You can either go do the home d delivery with your car on your time, you can do that, or I will do it with the company van and you get 50% of the commission on those sales. And Felix had a uh, Mercedes convertible, this sounds crazy, but he had a Mercedes convertible, the big one, and he would load that back seat up with paintings on an angle, tie them all down, and he would pull up in front of the house, when he was doing it, he would pull up in front of the house with that Mercedes convertible and like six paintings stuck in the back, and here would come this guy dressed very sharp, dressed very sharp, and uh, he would they'd open the door and say oh how nice and he'd have two paintings with him and oh how are you and he'd start bringing paintings in and they just bought one painting but he'd start bringing them in just thought you'd want to take a look at some others that you might you might be interested in some other time they would sell more than one painting almost every time yeah for sure okay I'm going to ask if there's any questions left then we're going to wrap this up and Rick you probably have 15 minutes to for you and Linda to get through this. No excuses, we want to leave you guys about half an hour to run back to your booze and tidy up, get the food put away. <laughs> Straighten the artworks. If somebody's pounding on the other side of your wall, you've already noticed it messes up your side. So, you know, and get, get ready to go. Well, any more questions? Yeah, right there. Yeah. Uh, do you have a, is there shipping available here? For yeah. shipping large art pieces? Yeah, uh, Rosa Del Monte is here. Uh, they're our shipper, and you can go to the show office and they'll give you the phone number. Okay? I have a question. I am the helper in the booth. My husband's the artist. Sometimes I ask him, they want to talk to him, not me. What do you suggest you do if you're the help in the booth? Uh, introduce to him to your to husband. Him, not me. I'd introduce him to my husband. Just start some jib jab, you know, how you doing today? Is there anything you like in the booth? Uh, you know, can I introduce you to the artist? That's what I would do. Be, be happy, smile, stand up if you can. You know, sit down once in a while, but stand up most of the time. Okay, thanks you guys. Rick and I just want to add um, to all of the information that has been given to you so far. Um, from the marketing perspective, you might know that um, I'm the director of marketing for Redwood Media and all the shows. So here's a couple of tips that I have for you in particular. Be sure that you have marketing materials. What does that mean? Business cards. And by the way, did you know that there's two sides to a business card? Just saying. There's two sides to tell your story, two sides to give your contact information, 
an image of your artwork that is really iconic um, for you, um, maybe even a, a tagline that absolutely identifies who you are and what you're all about. So two business cards and two sides to a business card. A handout of some kind. Um, could be just a, a rack card. A rack card is typically a third of an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and you can get them printed very economically. Um, and if you don't have anything yet, you could still get something done for this show. You can do it at overnight prints. You can go to FedEx office and get it printed. But I would definitely have something um, that you can hand to them in addition to a business card that keeps you top of mind, that makes you memorable to them. Obviously, it has all of your contact information on it. The other thing in terms of contacts, and I'm going to tell one of my very favorite stories of all. So we've already mentioned Tanner Lolly, who's sitting up front here. So about five years ago, Tanner and I met for the first time, and I talked him into uh, exhibiting at Art Expo New York. So he came, uh, took a small booth at Art Expo New York, and um, it, it was okay, um, kind of a last minute decision. But then he decided he would do Spectrum Miami during Miami Art Week. And by that time, uh, by the way, he had opened a gallery in Texas. And so not only was he showing some of his artwork, but a couple of his other artists. At the end of the show, he's packing up. I walk over, hey, how did it go? How did you do? He said, well, it was a pretty good show. I've got a lot of follow-up to do because I took names and contact information. There's the tip, there's the tip. I took names and contact information from a lot of people, but I gotta tell you, Linda, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed because see those tiny pieces over there? I, that's all I sold was three of them a few hundred dollars and I've spent all of this money to be in Miami. So I said, well, you know, you've got your contacts, you know, let's see what happens. So a couple of months later, so that's in December, February, I called him because he had, I'm on his mailing list, he'd sent out a newsletter and there was something about the newsletter that I wanted to call him and tell him congratulations, the piece is beautiful. And he said, I said, so how's it going? He said, well, I have to tell you what happened after Miami. I'm driving the truck from Miami back to Texas and somebody calls and says, you know that piece that was in the center of the booth? That great big piece of yours? I want that. Okay, well, I've got it. I'll, as soon as I get back to Texas, I'll make sure that I ship it to you. Two days later, somebody calls and says, you know that piece in the center of the booth? I want that. Well, it's already sold. But I'll tell you what, I can do a consignment for you, and it won't be exactly like that, but it'll be similar to that. Okay. The bottom line to that story, by the time he did his follow-up from his contacts that he had gathered at the show, he sold 27 pieces. Your business card, your marketing materials, and a guest book. Simple as that, a guest book. And after they walk away, you make a little note in that guest book what they liked because that's how you're gonna call them back. You're gonna reference, you're gonna, you won't remember everybody, there's gonna be thousands of people in here. But if you make those notations, you'll have a conversation in the waiting. And the other thing somebody asked about discounts, I would say, and I learned this actually from Rick, don't discount the artwork, but give them another opportunity. Give them the frame. Give them the shipping. Give them something else. Don't discount the artwork, but give them another opportunity. And then I'll end by quoting, uh, Eric already said, or maybe it was Rick that said, this, this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. 
I would give you one more example. The elevator's broken. You gotta take the stairs, one step at a time. The elevator's broken, there's no elevator in here. You gotta take the stairs, one step at a time. And we're here, we're here throughout the week, and by the way, if you haven't already checked it out, you wanna get one of the show handouts and there is a full topics and trends seminar schedule in here that runs the entire length of the show. Might be hard for some of you to get here, but if you, again, if you find one that you think is really important, they're all being recorded. They will be posted on our website after the show. Um, there are also seminars that are already posted on our website as a resource for you. So those are some tips and hints from the marketing perspective. I, I, let, let's just close with this, and then we'll open it up for final questions. Uh, you remember that I, some of you guys are my age. I'm 63, uh, and I remember the old story about how Hollywood and people would go to this, um, uh, they would go to this pharmacy or this drugstore where they had soda fountains and stars were discovered at this at this uh, drugstore. You remember, I don't, rename it, I don't remember the name of it, but Hollywood stars were discovered at this drugstore. So <clears throat> let me tell you that, that major names in the art world, major names in the art world, including names that have been mentioned on this stage, got their start or progressed their career here at Art Expo New York beginning 40 years ago. This is the largest art exhibition trade show in the world. The world comes to Art Expo New York. And 40 years ago, major artists like Warhol and commercial artists like Kincaid got their start at Art Expo New York. This is the world stage, and you are an exhibitor here. Let me tell you, our phone rings, guys, think about this. Our phone rings or our email hits are 40 to 50 times a day for artists and galleries and publishers wanting to get into this show. 40 to 50 times a day. And you know what we're really good at saying? No. No. No, 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 no. That's what we say all day long. And when we finally say yes, it's because we've found something, we've discovered something that we're excited about, that we want to share with the people that come walking through the door. You're part of that alumni beginning at this show. If this is your first show, congratulations. If it's your 20th show, we have people that have been exhibiting here every year for the last 30 years in a row. So if this is your first show, welcome. Welcome to the club. If you've been here before, welcome back. But understand this, this Art Expo New York is the world stage. It is that soda fountain in Hollywood where stars get discovered. Everybody is here this weekend. You have got to be on your A game. Really, this isn't a game. This isn't some little uh, thing that, oh yeah, I, I'm, I'm tired. That's the reason why my eyes are droopy. I, oh, it was just, I don't wanna hear it. I have no interest and no sympathy in you being tired or exhausted. My team is gonna be working 16 hours a day. They have been for the last four days and they're gonna be working for the next four days after this show, 16 hours a day. And during the show, they're gonna be working 16 hours a day. And I expect it from them. If they can't handle that, I'll find somebody else that can. It's plain and simple. You guys expect performance from us. We can't demand it of you, but we would ask you to consider demanding it of yourselves. The next four days, you have got to be on your A game. You have to be. Plain and simple. And I would encourage you and follow up with what Linda said uh, to look at that schedule. Things like this, this book, I'm telling you, I would not, ha having this book in my hand right now, I look at it and I go, I wouldn't be an artist or a gallery opening up today without having a copy of this book and reading it through. The Artist's Guide for Survival. And it's not about selling, or, it's all about the legal aspects of the art world. And Jay Landrum, who you'd have to pay $375 an hour to, to go talk to with a minimum of one hour, 
He's going to be here for a couple of hours, I think, during this week, right? A couple of hours, free. And he's going to be giving you a copy of this book, free. And he's going to talk to you about all the legal opportunities that exist for your work, free. So don't miss it. He's got an assistant here. Where's Chase Cameron? Is Chase around here? Chase, where are you? Where are you, Chase? Well, he's somewhere around here. Anyhow, Chase is his assistant. He'll be working this week. And uh, here's the book. Uh, you want to be here, here for those seminars. And um, we wish you the very best. We really do. I don't mean to be hard-nosed, but this isn't a game to me. You guys expect performance out of us. We're going to deliver. We want you to have a good show. Any other final questions that you got? No? That's it? Thanks a lot. Go get them.